uh, sleep apnea and uh, the don professor srinivas kishore has already given two talks and if you want to refer to those two talks it's there in our channel it's a very very elaborate uh, you know discourse i can say on uh, sleep apnea every small nuances has been touched upon by uh, dr srinivas kishore ji and today we are uh, having the third um, lecture in fact when i went to uh, trivandrum uh, for a conference recently i have been uh, pounded uh, like uh, you know with a lot of missiles when is the third lecture of uh, dr srinivas kishore he has become so 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 popular i really appreciate his uh, you know in depth knowledge and the willingness to teach from heart it it's different when you teach from heart it's different so really appreciate you sir and uh, without much ado we'll go on to the third part of sleep apnea and i think today we are going to deal with the uh, uh, the uh, surgical aspects and uh, you know over to you sir thank you very much boss thank you very much for your kind words i think uh, let's start with uh, um, the show today um, can you see my slides yep all right so last few uh, sessions last few uh, last two sessions you actually saw a glimpse and had a taste of uh, the pathophysiology the pathogenesis the kind of presentation the history how you go about evaluation um and as we all know we the 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 most commonest level of obstruction almost 70% of obstruction in the multiple levels of obstruction that happen in obstructive sleep apnea happen at the level of the palate so i thought it was very prudent for me to start from palatal procedures then we will go to hypopharyngeal procedures which i have divided into tongue base and epiglottis and then i uh, we are going to talk in detail about uh, uh, skeletal surgeries which i think all of us ent should know and should be able to perform and um so let's start off with the palate so i'm not going to go into run of the mill historical procedures here um i've sort of customized it to the title uh, i'm going to uh, call it new surgical techniques on soft palates and lessons learned from the past i'm not going to talk about all the historical procedures that we have uh, almost stopped doing now um now in the last 10 years there has been a paradigm shift among us sleep apnea surgeons towards more innovative anatomically targeted surgical procedures instead of the traditional non selective modifications of u triple p now the concept even though uh, the uh, concept of surgical success somehow it has not changed even today we stick to the shares criteria which is when you do any kind of surgical intervention you should actually abide by this rule and you should be able to get this success rate and what is this success rate it has to be a 50% reduction and an ahi to be reduced to 20 that means supposing you have an ahi of 100 if you reduce it to 50% that's not called success you should reduce it to 20% now that's a huge tall order and traditional unselected u triple p procedures could not unfortunately uh uh i mean come to terms with this tall order that has been put by uh, ellen sher what was happening on the other front we were talking about surgery what is happening on the other side cpap therapy which is so called curative therapy but with inconsistent adherence can potentially be equal to or it can be worse than surgeries 
unfortunately because people were not sticking to that adherence because cpap on one hand and surgery on the other hand right on cpap i think we 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 actually there was a talk that i thought that we will talk about this and we have time i have a beautiful talk wherein i pitted uh, pap therapy versus surgery what is the evidence out there and how um, each one of us as ent surgeons based on the evidence that is out there uh, should come to a conclusion for your patient so if time willing we will probably do that so the concepts have completely changed over the past 10 years now this is a procedure that i have done this is my surgery i have done this in 2013 and if i put a tongue depressor and i look in front i can see that it looks good this is a procedure that i used to think that wow man this is a good surgery and the patient also would have come back to me and said boss my snoring has completely gone but some of my symptoms my excessive daytime sleepiness my um uh, symptoms of being tired they still there right then i would think why why did that happen and then i put a scope and did a drug induced sleep endoscopy and this beautiful palette which you are looking at it from the front when a patient is awake the moment you do put him to sleep and did a drug induced sleep endoscopy the complete palette and now the whole picture has changed for me this is my own surgery and i am not ashamed to say that so what are the lessons that we have learned from u triple p and layups which are laser assisted upper uh, uh, which are uh, uvular palatal procedures now these are non selected procedures surgeries every patient because you know how to do it we were just doing the procedures and we thought we were just eliminating the cause for obstruction we saw an obstruction there and we eliminated and mind please remember some of these guys actually got very good success rates from 80% to 20% if you look at so why is there such a wide success rate because we did not introspect every single patient were subjected to this particular procedure called lab or u triple p because some of the patients had obstructions at the level of the palate and not understanding the behavior of the upper airway we did the surgery and some of us lucked out and the success rate was 80% on the contrary there was there were a, a, a bunch of patients in whom without selecting you applied u triple p for them your success rate is 20% so their the success the results in terms of success rates were all over the room 80% to 20% you also are not sure so over a period of uh, where we are today from where in 1960 the first palatal procedure was started by a, a a professor in in japan called ikimatsu at that at that time he actually wanted to eliminate snoring okay and then ikimatsu did the first uvula palato pharyngoplasty in 1960 because and it was performed on a on a lady patient on a woman primarily because she the the she came to this particular gentleman professor ikimatsu and said boss do something to eliminate my snoring and he did that procedure and he was very successful and all of us ent surgeons started doing the same procedure same procedure and then ultimately landed up with this very abysmal success rate with averaging anywhere between 80 to 20% so from 1960s to where we are today in the era of all the robotic surgery and the era of upper airway stimulation there is still a role for palatal surgery 
but we don't call these resec uh, call the surgeries resection surgeries we call them reconstruction surgeries so what are these newer principles so the principles of reconstructive surgery are you are addressing the exact anatomical site of collapse you are trying to preserve the mucosa and the soft tissue you respect the muscle and the anatomical function that it does so all these three points were completely absent in the earlier u triple p techniques please understand this concept okay this is by professor shu yu li from taiwan this is mucosa this is adipose tissue this is muscle this is lymphoid tissue preserve mucosa as much as possible ablate adipose tissue uh, try to make slings and makes flaps for muscle and if there is lymphatic tissue remove it this is the funda of the new born palatal procedures now the newer techniques basically came out of lot of these techniques are basically more technical and had logical these are logical techniques okay and you have because now we have the understanding of how the upper airway behaves thanks to all the drug induced sleep endoscopies and our own understanding of reading our sleep studies so with all this understanding of uh, of uh, the the behavior of the upper airway the newer palatal surgeries have come to stay and as i said dice has completely changed the way we understand the behavior of the upper airway and we know now based on this dice that uh, uh, once we understand the pattern of collapse the site of collapse the severity of collapse we are trying to understand what is the underlying muscle there and we are trying to address it so what are the new concepts you want to understand three basic fundas what is the structure causing the obstruction what is the pattern causing the obstruction what is the severity of obstruction for example earlier the problem was only levels of obstruction is it palatal level is it oropharyngeal level is it uh, hypopharyngeal level no we don't talk like that nowadays we talk about is it the salpingopharyngeal fold which is causing the obstruction is it the palatopharyngeus muscle which is causing the obstruction is it tonsil that is causing the obstruction so the emphasis is on structure not the level second thing how is the collapse is it an anterior posterior collapse is it a lateral collapse or is it circumferential collapse and then last but not the least is it complete collapse or is it partial collapse so these are the newer concepts of palatal surgery so with that now there are a myriad of surgeries that are available these are a few of the surgeries that we now do which we now call reconstructive palatal surgeries anterior palatoplasty lateral pharyngoplasty version 1 to 6 which is uh, uh, which are from brazil professor uh, uh, michel kahali expansion sphincter pharyngoplasty the variations of expansion sphincter pharyngoplasty called the functional expansion pharyngoplasty the relocation pharyngoplasty and of course the boss of all palatal procedures the plethora of uh, uh, bar brief positioning pharyngoplasties bar brief positioning pharyngoplasties again have lot of subtypes the bar roman blinds the bar lateral the bar anterior pharyngoplasty and the alienza techniques these are all the different types and modifications of bar pharyngoplasties let's start with the most humble of the uh, reconstructive palatoplasty called anterior palatoplasty so when do you do anterior palatoplasty when you see an anterior posterior collapse that is happening 
please uh, pardon the scope. The scope is actually, uh, this is anterior, this is posterior. And because of these, uh, the, uh, the, the way I put the scope, uh, uh, you are finding it to be side to side. So this is the way, the, this is the anterior posterior collapse that is happening for this particular patient. So what is anterior palatoplasty? What do you want to do? You want to create space behind the soft palate because the palate is collapsing in an anterior posterior direction. This is AP collapse, so you do an AP procedure. Anterior posterior collapse, you do an anterior palatoplasty. So what do you do in this? You are creating a uh, a, a rectangular uh, soft tissue scar formation so that the palate actually, once the, uh, the scar forms, you are creating a scar. It's all about vector formation. All the new palatal surgeries are all about um, vectors. These are scar vectors, we call them. And you create a 1.5 or a 1 into 2 centimeters scar at just distal, one centimeter distal to the hard palate, soft palate junction. Now, this is a, a, a scar once formed, you will create a, a scar vector which is going anteroposteriorly. Now, this kind of a, a, a palatal procedure actually uh, in the in the meta analysis scored very very high in terms of AHI reduction. So let me just quickly take you through how you do this procedure. So you're creating based on the uh, palate, you're creating a raw area here. This is one of the most simplest procedures. Um, you can use coblation, you can use bipolar. You can. It is not about the tool. It is, uh, it is about the person behind the tool that is important. So I'm using radio frequency. Uh, you can use just monopolar uh, 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 diathermy as well. So you're creating this raw area. And once you create this raw area, And then you have to also create two para uvular trenches. Now you can create the para uvular trenches at the beginning of the procedure or at the end of the procedure. For wanting of time, let me just uh, um, fast forward this. So now I'm creating this para uvular trenches. Just para uvular, so they are just parallel to the uvula. You are cutting the medially arching fibers of the palatoglossus as well as the palatopharynges. So, you don't want any kind of centri centripetal, uh, centrifugal forces coming in. So you're cutting this. And once you create this, so this is a procedure you do for anteroposterior collapse. Please do not totally sacrifice the uvula. All these procedures are uvula sparing procedures. As you can see, you can trim the tip of the uvula, but you cannot sacrifice the entire uvula. You can actually make a fish mouth here also, and then you can use your coblator and eat up that little bit of tissue there. Please remember the posterior, the upper part or the base of the uvula has lot of uh, nerve fibers, which gives the sensation to the brain about uh, uh, how, uh, about deglutition, the sense of uh, uh, secretions. And 
So always preserve the posterior part of the base of the uvula. And then once that is done, you can use PDS or simple vicral sutures to um, slowly take two kinds of, so it has to be a bi-layered closure. It has to be a bi-layered closure like this. And one more important thing, whenever you do soft palate surgery or any kind of uh, um, OSA surgery on the soft palate, the suture should not be very tight. Make sure that the, the, the knot is just snug. If you tighten it too much, there will be necrosis. And one is, and that is the most important or the commonest cause for wound dehiscence. So, dear colleagues, do not, do not make very tight stitches like how you make it elsewhere. It can't be. So, just make it snug and fit in there because we don't want to compromise on the vascularity. We just want approximation. Nature will do the rest. So in terms of the suture that is being used, you can use Vicryl, you can use PDS, um, but mostly we don't use any kind of monocryl uh, because we, we want a nice scar to form. And uh, as we progress in the talks and in the lectures that you will understand that um, uh, more and more sophistication has come. So this is uh, anterior palatoplasty. You should do it in two layers, always muzzle followed by mucosa. And here there will be a good scar that will be formed. And again, like I said, do not, do not um, make the scars very, uh, I mean, so don't make the suture too tight. And once that is done, you can suture this part. And then you can start off now with the mucosal. Just approximation, right? Mucosa to mucosa now. Now, lateral pharyngoplasty. Lateral pharyngoplasty is a procedure that, has, that is extremely popular in Brazil. Um, wherein after tonsillectomy, you cut in at the base, at the bed of the um, uh, tonsillar bed, you identify the obliquely running fibers of the superior constrictor muscle, not to confuse with the vertically running fibers of the palatopharyngeus muscle. Once you cut the uh, the obliquely running fibers of the, uh, of the superior constrictor, the anterior fibers of the superior constrictor should be sutured to the palatoglossus and the, the posterior, the cut part of the palatopharyngeus muscle has to be sutured in an anterolateral direction. And you get an anterolateral scar vector. Now, this is a procedure that I have no experience in for a very, very reason where the very fact that you are getting, once you cut the parapharynge, uh, once you cut the superior constrictor muscle, you are entering into the parapharyngeal space. This particular procedure is extremely painful. I've had very bad experience with it. I have just done it once and I have abandoned it. Uh, I've had very bad experience with it, but Professor Michel Kahali uh, has one to six uh, uh, versions of the same. But in terms of the results, they, are, they have great results. As you have seen, an RCT was also done. The AHI coming down from 33 to 10, 10 along with reduction of nocturnal blood pressure. Others, other authors have also done Professor Kim from Korea. 78% success rate at uh, uh, six, six months. Uh, Marina Carrasco, she has got uh, pretty good results. Uh, but 
look at the patient sample size, 10 patients. And this are at all 100% success rate uh, after uh, 20 uh, months follow. But unfortunately for me, um, somehow uh, I have not, the, not got the courage to uh, uh, open up the peripheral space. So uh, I will go on record and say I have uh, had a very bad experience with it. That does not mean the procedure is not great. It is a great procedure. As you have seen, these patients, these, uh, 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 I mean, studies that have been published have got great uh, results. Now, I do uh, this particular procedure, which has taught to be my professor, uh, Professor Tucker Woodson. And I've done, I do a variation of that. And when do you do expansion sphincter pharyngoplasty? In patients on dice, you see a lateral collapse happening at the level of the velum. The velum, for those of you who have, uh, uh, just to, rip, to brush up your uh, memory, velum is that part of the soft palate that touches the posterior pharyngeal wall. The patterns at the level of the velum can be three types. Anteroposterior, for which you do an anterior palatoplasty. You do a, a, a lateral to lateral, like you see here, which in, you do an expansion sphincter pharyngoplasty. Now, there are variations of the expansion sphincter pharyngoplasty called the functional expansion sphincter uh, pharyngoplasty, popularized by my dear friend Ottavio Pichin from uh, Bologna. Um, here is a diagram, and then I will show you the video. So, what do you do? After tonsillectomy, you will see two kinds of muscles here. See, this is the uvula. This is the condensation of the, uh, we call this the pterygomandibular. Uh, are we okay? Hello? 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 Uh, are we here? Uh, hello? Hello, um, oh, okay, sorry. All right, so sorry about that, guys. Um, so coming back to functional expansion. So there are two muscles in the bay. Uh, once you remove the tonsil, the palatopharyngeus and the palatoglossus. So the palatopharyngeus muscle, you basically lift it off the bed of the tonsil. You make a muscle tendon. Once you do that, you create a small uh, you create a small incision at the level of the uh, pterygoid hamilus. And then take this suture, the tendon stitch from, from the upper part of the tonsillar bed towards the pterygoid hamilus and then make a suture like this. So let me just play the video. Something happening here. Right. So now, this is expansion sphincter pharyngoplasty, and uh, it's actually called functional expansion sphincter pharyngoplasty. Try not to button out into the mucosa. So the medial incision is here. Again, it's always better to use a Colorado needle or a radio frequency as I'm doing it. 
these how do you differentiate the vertically running fibers of with the oblique running fibers so you can very beautifully see the vertically running fibers of the palatopharyngeus muscle to the oblique running fibers as you can see here this here is the obliquely running fibers of the superior constrictor muscle so this muscle this incision should be longer this should be shorter and then once you do that there is one care that you need to be uh, you need to take care of and that is sometimes you may have an aberrant keratin in the in this region and also the glossopharyngeal nerve so once so once you created this muscle uh, once you've cut it here at the junction between the upper two thirds and lower one third then you take a muscle stitch now what those of you must have observed that some of the muscle fibers are still tethered to the base there so you don't want to cut all the muscle fibers now you take a 20 y krill and you uh, take a tendon stitch and once you do a tendon stitch because you want to bunch up all those muscles together and once you do that now that the all those muscle fibers will not tear now how where you will cut the muscle tendon will depend upon the distance that your muscle uh, you want to transpose this particular muscle so let me explain this now if the distance between the superior pole of the tonsil and the pterygoid hamulus is very long then you will be taking a long ten, a long bundle so you can go almost up to the base of the tonsillar fossa and take a long tendon so now this area is very rich in vascular you have all the descending uh, branches of the i mean the branches of the descending palatine so you better infiltrate in this area once you do that you hold it with a non tooth suture and take a curved a uh, long artery go sub mucosally and from here try to feed the and see you can come out at the upper part of the superior pole of the tonsil once you do that it's just it just the microscope see now now you are pulling the stitch now your colleague will be holding this and put keep putting traction so once you put the traction now you can go in with a 20y krill and then start putting the sutures from here try to come out at the bed of the tonsil i mean the the superior pole of the tonsil and then again from there to here you put multiple stitches the whole idea is to bring in this open up this particular port now you can see as i keep doing it because we are looking in a 2d video you are not able to appreciate it but then you can see at this part the whole this part gets keeps going up you know just keeps going up and then you go up and then suture it and at the end of the procedure you will have a box and the success rates are pretty good and 6 month success rate is about 89% this is another procedure that you can do in kind of in terms uh, when you have a lateral 
uh, to uh, a lateral obstruction. This is called Sam Robinson's. Here, it's a little more aggressive procedure. The base, you create a triangle. The base is the pterygomandibular raphe. And you can see this is the pterygomandibular raphe. And then you create this particular uh, base like this. Again, you can use any uh, sort of a tool. Always try to make it symmetrical. See, this is the base of the uvula. A tonsillectomy has been already done. We're doing this. And now you can create this flap. So now, now that these flaps have been created, use a non-toothed forceps, always, always. Now this is a, a flap that has been created. Now deepen this particular incision here. The one that is almost parallel to the medially running fibers of the palatoglossus. And now you deepen this particular And this is this is live patients was this is not uh, so now you are actually now we are exposing this supra tonsillar fat pad and then it is very very important to clear off the supra tonsillar fat pad as you would also see in the bab surgeries that I'm going to show you. See this is the supra tonsillar fat pad. And this is the lateral pharyngeal port that we have opened up. So now you are, now this is the supratonsillar fat pad that we have removed. So you have to go as lateral as possible. Again, a little more of that fat is left. So we're removing that. The, some branches of the descending palatine. And always, always use non-toothed forceps. And uh, absolute hemostasis. So keep traction. Traction is the, is the mantra in all kinds of uh, palatal procedures. So be careful not to damage the mucosal um, flap here. So this whole thing is now cleared. Once this whole thing is cleared, now these medially arching fibers of the palatoglossus muscle. Now the same thing is repeated on the opposite side. Once that is done, you are making the same cut that we did in expansion sphincter pharyngoplasty. The only difference here is that there you are not cutting the mucosa, whereas here you go and cut the entire muscle, including the mucosa. So this is the medially, uh, these are the fibers of the palatopharyngeus uh, muscle. Now you're completely releasing that. And once you release these muscles, again, even in this procedure, you need to be very careful to um, sort of identify if you've had an aberrant carotid or a glossopharyngeal, because if there is a glossopharyngeal nerve there and if you have cut it, 
uh, God save us because that patient is going to have severe, severe glossopharyngeal neuralgia. All this is, uh, I have, I have personal experience with this. Unfortunately, I've had all the bad experiences and I can tell you that for sure that you have to be super careful. So when you do these surgeries in order to identify these very delicate structures, uh, it's always better to operate under the microscope or at least uh, uh, an endoscopic, uh, uh, you know, uh, endoscopic holder or the the VTOM, um, the new uh, uh, I think uh, VTOM, the Carl Stores VTOM has 3D as well. Amazing, amazing uh, resolution and uh, so once this is done, you identify this particular. So now this is the palate of pharyngeus. This is the palate of glossus, and now you've exposed this particular uh, lateral pharyngeal port, as we call it. So now what you do is we cut this and then transpose this muzzle from here and relocate it and suture it to the pterygopalatine raphe. That's how it is done, just to sort of fast forward this whole thing. And now you can see we have cut the medially arching fibers of the. So now this whole thing is opened up. And this fire suture, these medially arching fibers are sutured into this particular area. Now you can see. And you can see how beautifully this whole procedure is. Now you can see the box happening and the entire mucosa to mucosa is sutured. And please remember again, without resecting the palate, the, the, the uvula, you are able to get good, good result. And uh, uh, these are all palate uh, uvula sparing procedures. And uh, this gives excellent results. So when do you do a Sam, Sam Robinson as opposed to a, a, a sort of say a procedure which is more delicate? When you have a very thick palate is when you choose modified Sam Robinsons. Now there is another procedure called relocation pharyngoplasty. The procedure is very, very similar the only difference is here that you take, once the tonsillectomy is over, you I again identify the oblique fibers of the palato, uh, uh, the superior constrictor muscle, and the vertical running fibers of the palato pharyngeus muscle. Then you relocate these fibers to a point which is superior lateral. Once this whole area is, uh, is denuded of the mucosa, and you can see these minor salivary glands. So here what you're doing, the anterior pal, uh, this is very similar to the uh, lateral pharyngoplasty that I spoke to you about, without cutting the superior constrictor muscle. So you are suturing the palatoglossus to the superior constrictor, and then you're suturing the uh, palatopharyngeus muscle to a raw area that you have created superior laterally. When do you do this? When you have a very sort of a thin palate. Now, barb, the, the, the advent of barb sutures have completely revolutionized the way we do palate surgery nowadays. Does that mean that we don't do the surgeries that I spoke to you about? No, not really. We, there are specific palatal phenotypes with which, for which you do those particular procedures. Even though slowly the variations and barb variations are slowly coming into, uh, uh, into, into mainstream and slowly those procedures also, which we now call re, uh, reconstructive palatal procedures are also going off into oblivion. So I'll talk to you uh, in, in detail about and, and diagrammatically about these particular procedures. 
which are uh, all inspired from barb sutures, which uh, the plastic surgeons or the facial plastic surgeons have been using for a very long time. Now, what is barb Roman blind techniques? Barb Roman blind techniques is, is, is a procedure where you have to select it in a normal or a thin palate when you have a circumferential collapse. So how do you go about doing this particular procedure? You can start at the junction of the hard and soft palate and the dot, dot, dot basically means that the whole procedure is submucosal. Once I show you the video, you will understand what these are. The same procedure, which is barb lateral pharyngoplasty, can be done in, uh, in, with a barb technique. The only difference is there are no cuts. There are no, um, uh, like how I just showed you different kinds of procedures in the soft palate, wherein we have cut in all those areas and exposed those muscles. You don't have those things. And then you have the barbed anterior pharyng uh, uh, pharyngoplasty, very similar to the kind of procedure that um, we did as anterior palatoplasty. Alienza technique, which is the procedure that you do um, wherein you have a circumferential collapse on dice. Now, all of these procedures are on one side and the barb reposition uh, the reposition pharyngoplasty is on one side. Why? Because this is a procedure that has been inspired from all the procedures that I spoke to you about. So if you know and understand this particular procedure that I'm going to talk to you about, which is, uh, I think, in, 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 uh, in very simple terms and words, the best uh, sort of a BAP procedure in terms of publications as well, and it's backed with a lot of data. So first I'm going to show you the diagrams, and then I will show you the surgical video. So you have to identify, after tonsillectomy, you identify the pterygomandibular raphe and the posterior nasal spine. Once you do that, then you uh, basically cut the supratonsillar area, especially at the level of the, uh, uh, the medially running fibers of the palatoglossus muscle. So this is the pterygomandibular raphe. These are the medially arching fibers of the palatoglossus, and then you make a cut. Once you make a cut on the, just where the uh, uh, palatoglossus is arching, the next step you do, is to cut the palatopharyngeus muscle almost at the, jun uh, at the junction of the upper two-thirds and lower uh, upper two-thirds and lower one-third. This is all the dissection that you need to do. Once you do this dissection, then the barb suture uh, starts. So you start with the junction of the hard and the soft palate, then you come out at this particular area which is the junction between the base of the soft, uh, the base of the uvula and the medially arching uh, point of the palatoglossus. Then you enter here and exit here. Once you exit here, the point about barb suture is that wherever you enter, you have to exit at the same point. So you enter here, you exit here, and then from here, you go submucosally, you reach out to the lateral, uh, the pterygomandibular raphe and exit out at that particular point. From that particular point onwards, you come medially and take the bundle of the palatopharyngeus muscle into, uh, uh, into your uh, suture and then again come up and exit at the pterygomandibular raphe. And this way you go zigzag, zigzag. And once you do at least three sutures, then you exit out and exit out into the soft palate. And this is, these are the steps of the uh, procedure called barb repositioning pharyngoplasty. Now let's just go through with the video. 
So let me just, uh, so this is the uh, um, posterior pillar. This is the anterior pillar. And we are now measuring the distance between the um, palatopharyngeus muscle. And then once that is done, it's always important that you measure the distance. And this is the junction between the hard and soft palate. So it's always better that you infiltrate this area, otherwise you will have bleeds. And you start off with that particular point. You palpate it. This is the marking. This is the pterygomandibular raphe. This is the junction between the hard and soft palate. This, these are the other points that I was uh, talking to you about. And now I'm making this incision that I spoke to you about in the bed of the tonsil. You want to cut these vertically running fibers of the palatopharyngeus muscle. And then you make it free. And then is a very important step here. You want to identify the supratonsillar fat pad area. And uh, So this cut is very important. As you would have seen in, in a modified Sam Robinson also, that part was clearly cut. Now, why is that important? Because this is a centrifugal muscle. That means it brings the soft palate together. This is the palatoglossus. So it's important that you cut it and you square off. We call this step squaring off. And then you identify the uh, supratonsillar fat pad and removing the supratonsillar fat pad is very important to sort of get that squaring off effect and you want that scar to be solid. See, now you can see the supratonsillar fat pad there. Beautifully, you, 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 you take it out. Yes, so once this is done, all the dissection is done. And then you start off with uh, the suture now. Your entry and you exit at the same point. This is not rocket science. Anybody can do this. It's fairly simple. The most important thing is the tug. You want to be keep tugging on with every pull. Make sure that you don't button out into the, the mucosa. And once you keep you keep pulling it, you keep pulling it. Yes. And this is how you get a complete closure. And you can how see you can see how beautifully these things have completely closed. And the same procedure is done on the opposite side. Let me just again show it in a very different way. Um, again, this is the marking. That was with a microscope, and this is with an endoscope. This is tonsillectomy. And OSA tonsillectomy is a little different. We, we sort of clear off the anterior uh, pillar in a, in a more aggressive way. And you can see now, this side is done. doing the, the opposite side as well. Once the tonsil is done,
Now I'm using the uh, radio frequency to sort of cut the muzzle here. And these are the markings for the um, barb reposition pharyngoplasty. So now you can see how I'm cutting the palatopharyngeus muscle. This is the uvula. Cutting the palatopharyngeus muscle, you identify the vertically running fibers and you cut the palatopharyngeus muscle. And it's very important. Uh, some uh, or um, some people who do uh, BRP, they don't cut it because they think that it gives a better talk. But uh, to, in my hands, it it basically cuts the tissue. So I don't. So this is this is me cutting the medially arching fibers, and we are identifying the supratonsillar fat pad area here. And now, so this is the uh, V-lock suture. Entry is from here. Exit is from that point, which is a midpoint that I showed up. And then you go in from the pterygomandibular raphe. From the pterygomandibular raphe, you try to go into the so it's very, very important that you keep tugging on the uh, uh, every time you take a bite, you keep tugging on it. and see how this whole thing got elevated. So just for comparison, you, you can see this side, which is the, uh, the sutured side, and this side, which is the non-sutured side. It's beautifully, the whole thing is just lifted up and without hardly any kind of dissection. So once that is done, you're coming into the midline, and you repeat the same thing on the opposite side. And you can see how beautifully this op uh, the opposite side has also come up. And now I'm using the 55 to channel the uvula so that it shrinks. So get, you get a beautiful stumped uvula at the end of the procedure. You can see how with minimal dissection, the entire uh, thing is suspended. And uh, this is very gratifying. You get beautiful results at the end of the procedure. Now, post-operatively, uh, these are great results. These are not my results. This is Professor Piccini's results, but um, our results echo the same kind of thing. Uh, thank you very much. Let me just stop this now. And uh, then go on with uh, my next presentation, which is uh, Yes, was. Somebody has raised the hand. Yeah, Dr. Vijay Kumar is raising his hands. Uh, you can ask the question, Dr. Vijay Kumar. Hello, Dr. Vijay Kumar. You can type the question if you want or ask the question. I think he's... I will go with the next uh, uh, Dr. Srinivasji. Yes. Yeah, you can carry on with uh, the next uh, this one. Yeah, yeah, I will. I will. 
it's uh, the next one is uh, um, hypopharyngeal procedures. Let me just. Are you going to talk about Zeta? No, Zeta is something that we've completely given up. I think most of us have uh, completely given up uh, Zeta. So I'm not, unless somebody specifically interested, I can share the video with them. Uh, yeah, I think you can also talk about Zeta. Oh, sure. I can. I so will. You, you do only Bard now, is it? Bard only. Yes, was the entire world sort of shifted to Bard and its variations. Okay. Uh, can you just uh, can you see the presentation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, so, tackling tongue base is uh, what I've titled this talk on, and it's basically when and how you go about uh, doing this. So, but why tongue, right? So, if you look at uh, dice uh, uh, studies, you would know that even the soft palate contributes to 84% of uh, obstructions. Tongue base contributes to about 51% of, uh, uh, of obstruction. So this is definitely there, even though you want to get away with uh, not doing a tongue-based procedure, it's, it's, it's basically looking at you with a 51% incidence that, um, that there is a significant tongue-based obstruction. You have to deal with it. So soft palate procedures are the commonest type of uh, a surgery performed on OSA, but residual obstructions at the tongue base uh, are found in about 17 to 33% of the patients when you basically look at from a literature perspective. But the same thing, when you look at it from a DICE perspective, it's almost 50%. So what is the link first between obesity and OSA? So if you look at this dissection, and you would basically be surprised to see that 28 to 32% of tongue-based obstruction uh, of fat deposition happens at the level of the tongue base. So it's very obvious and it's easy to, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's a no brainer that if you do not tackle this tongue base obstruction, it's going to sort of bite you in the back and say, look, I'm here, you have to deal with me. So a lot of interest came in with this beautiful paper, which is very old. This is published in 2007. But this gives you an understanding uh, that if you look at the percentage of tongue fat and where it is again deposited, the uh, this hollow squares are the percentage of tongue fat with the PMI and the diamonds are the uh, are the anterior tongue and the and the and uh, the hollow triangle uh, hollow squares are the posterior tongue. So if you see, as the BMI is increasing, the tongue fat is also increasing. And where is it getting deposited? All in the posterior tongue. It is not getting deposited in the anterior tongue. So with this graph, uh, we know that. The, as the BMI increases, the tongue fat gets accumulated uh, in the posterior uh, tongue base. Now, here is a very interesting uh, uh, paper. It basically told us that even though the BMI is, uh, is high, in, in patients with obstructive sleep apnea, somehow they have this special attraction to attract, and, uh, attract fat and put it in the tongue base. Look at this particular picture. If the BMI is same, but the AHI in this gentleman is about 59.1%, but in this gentleman, it is 9.6%. So even though the BMI is matched, just because their AHI is different, the amount of tongue-based fat is different. 
So what does this study tell us? It basically tells us that something about sleep apnea attracts fat into the tongue base. So this has got something to do with the, the, uh, the pathophysiology of obstructive sleep apnea. And obviously there are lots of things that we can uh, discuss at uh, at later date about that. But this is something that you need to understand that tongue fat is not only associated with uh, BMI, but has a special attraction to OSA patients. So let's talk about taming the tongue now. So when you look at tongue, right, you have to phenotype it into these basic categories. So tongue base comes in these different types. So you're either having a macroglossia, that means an absolute macroglossia, that means just a beefy tongue, a tongue wherein there is a lot of fat or a lot of muscle. Then you have retronathia. That means it's, a re it's an absolute, it's not an absolute macroglossia, but it's a relative macroglossia. So to that tongue, the jaw is too small. Then you have hypotonia, then you have lingual tonsil hyperplasia, and then you have loss of coupling. So these are the phenotypes based on the pathology. Now, fortunately or unfortunately, these phenotypes don't come in isolation. They are not mutually exclusive. They come in combinations. So you have to deal with them. So Moore's classification is the easiest classification. Those of you who have uh, attended the first talk would know that this sort of gives you an understanding of the kind of tongue base that is there and that can cause obstruction. And based on this, you will decide whether you have to tackle the upper tongue base or the tongue base together. Now, the easiest of the tongue bases to tackle is the lingual tonsils. And Michael Friedman divided them into classes A to E. So A means very, very scarce, a uh, very sparse uh, lymphoid in the tongue base. Number two means very occasional uh, uh, follicles of uh, uh, lymphoid tissue, wherein you can very clearly see the valicular and the epiglottis. From C onwards, the valicular keeps getting filled up with lymphoid tissue. D and E is where just the tip of the epiglottis is visible and E means the entire epiglottis is not, not visible. Now, obviously, in lingual tonsils, you will try conservative methodologies. You will try to tra take care of the laryngopharyngeal reflux and postnasal drip. But the basic, the basic surgical intervention and the easiest way to do it is um, lingual tonsil excision. Now you can do it in many ways. You can see how huge this lingual tonsil is. You have one blob here and one blob here. Now you can do it in, in two ways and I will show you both the techniques. This is me standing on the side with the tongue yanked out. Uh, this is the uvula there and this is the uh, this, this huge tongue base here, and uh, you can use it. The advantage of this particular technique is that your cublation wand doesn't get clogged. So as you can, as you go from layer to layer, why won't it get clogged? Because it is going with gravity, right? So if you are in the roses position and the cublator wand is going uh, and the saline is going against gravity, then you will have trouble. So you now you can see that uh, the most, the entire procedure is almost done. And you can see uh, layer by layer, we have gone and uh, cleared it off. This is the epiglottis and this is the intubation. Now, these are, this is the base. 
and make sure that this whole area is cleared off. Now, if you look at more sophistication, you know, you're standing at the in roses position. This is also lingual tonsil, but you're in, this is roses position. And we are going in layer by layer here again. You want to ablate. Um, so when you are adopting this particular technique, try to keep the wand to the side, right? And uh, let it not get clogged up because the biggest problem is wands getting clogged up when you're doing tongue-based excisions. Now, another technique, another uh, trick that actually helped me is that uh, you put a pressure pump. You know, when you do a pressure pump, you can, uh, so you can now see the epiglottis is now, the vallicula is clean. Here the vallicula is cleared, here the lingual tonsil is there. Right? We're going layer by layer. This is a child actually with, uh, um, with OSA, lingual tonsil. This is a post um, adenotonsil lectomy child, you can see how small the uvula is. Um, this had a patient had residual OSA. One of the commonest co sites at which there will be residual OSA in children is lingual tonsils. So your limit of dissection, your starting dissection is foramen cecum, and your limit of dissection is you have to completely bare open the vallicula. You need to be very careful at this point because at this point, the epiglottic branch of the uh, lingual artery comes in. So, so the tricks here are try to keep the wand to one side. Don't dig the wand. Try to uh, put a pressure pump and um, try to play with the uh, try to play with the uh, with the plasma and uh, go side to side. Uh, completely expose the uh, the vallicula. That should be your end point of dissection. That's how you have to go about and completely clear it off. And uh, now, in some patients where there is absolute macroglossia, like this, wherein you can see this this tongue is just not fitting into the mouth, you can see the steep scallopings. And uh, this is on dice. It looks, this is on MRI. You can see how the tongue is just squeezing and causing the epiglottis to, uh, to sort of crush. When you tackle this kind of tongue bases, the most important thing that we are scared of is the neurovascular bundle. But you don't have to be worried because there are lots of dissections that were done. So the neurovascular bundle is located 2.7 centimeters inferior and lateral to the foramen cecum. Now, how do you know? This is beautiful because once you have, and those of you who have seen the Kubletter wand, right? That is 2.5 centimeters. So you can actually measure with one coblator length, and you, you can use 1.5, 1.5, that will be about three, and 2.7 is the, uh, the distance that you can go deep and go laterally. So you can use the coblation uh, foot, the pad of the, or the active electrode of your coblation to uh, measure as a rough estimate to go about and uh, do the dissection when you do the um, when you do the tongue base. So when you have acquired macroglossia, you can also get away with simple procedures. This is radio frequency ablation. You can use 55 or SP. You can put three uh, dots one, one centimeter in front of the foramen cecum and ablate for 15-15 seconds. Now, you can also put 
two lateral ports, one centimeter anterior to the line drawn laterally from the foramen cecum. Now, this is not a standalone single procedure. This you have to do multiple times to get meaningful results. Now, this is a, uh, a procedure which is, uh, uh, this is something that I showed you. This is classical midline glossectomy. Now, classical midline glossectomy, like I showed you, like how I showed in the earlier uh, video, uh, you can do the lateral, um, I mean, lateral to medial or medial to lateral, layer by layer. The end point is the uh, valicula. Uh, you should completely expose the valicula. Now, this is submucosal technique. In submucosal technique, you identify the foramen cecum, and then you can uh, make a submucosal tunnel with your endoscope. Keep going, keep going. With your tunnel, you can keep tunneling, and you can see with the uh, coblation you are, uh, you can basically make a furrow. You enter at this point and then you can go, you can use your plasma, keep going, keep going. You enter at the level of the foramen cecum and then you exit just above the, uh, the epiglottis. Um, as you can see, the, the coblator wand, you have to be very careful not to go too laterally. So use the, as you can see, this whole thing will just collapse inside. Will collapse inside like this. And this is submucosal procedure. And you would exit out there and this whole thing will collapse. This is very good for macroglossia. Now, sometimes in severe sleep apnea, you may have to go and do massive resections. Uh, in, that, in such cases, you will have to use a precise max wand. Um, you can see how uh, we can use the plasma for your advantage. Um, do not touch. Coblation is a non-touch technique. Uh, you can see this is a massive tongue-based resection. For want of time, let me just, uh, so we've completely resected it uh, from the foramen cecum to the uh, valicula here. You can see that. In such massive resections, we do uh, a tracheostomy just to be on the safe side. You can see here that the, the valicula, and uh, it's important that you denude this particular part of the epiglottis so that you create a coagulum here. And so that once you scar off the, the median glossal epiglottic fold, this scars and uh, uh, the, the epiglottis sort of gets retroflexed and gets fixed to the tongue base. Um, should be very, very careful not to uh, sort of create a scar formation at the laryngeal surface of the epiglottis. It should be, uh, that's very important that you do it. This is how it's done. Um, always, always, non-touch technique, not to st uh, stop at any area, keep hovering, keep hovering. Layer by layer, you will create um, the, and this is the end of the procedure. You can see, um, I have almost exhausted two wands. I've used a precise wand, and now uh, I'm using a EVAC 70 wand. Um, for those of you who want to, this is a regular tonsil uh, sort of a um, Maul Davis mouth gag. And I'm using plasma here. Should be very careful uh, because here at this point, the lingual branch of the, the epiglottic branch should could come in. 
and uh, take your endoscope as close as possible. And you can see how your plasma is sort of ablating and use your plasma to your advantage to sort of um, ablate this uh, particular uh, uh, tissue. Now, this is, uh, this is again a massive resection uh, wherein um, this is a, pa a patient with amyloidosis wherein you do a midline glossectomy. Um, and uh, again, you, and you exit at the level. You can see the, gloss the genio glossus muscle. You can see it, how beautifully it is fanning out. This is absolutely macro. This is absolute macroglossia. You can use your Doyne's mouth gag to splay it open. Uh, stay in the midline, um, and you can exit at the level of the epiglottis. So you can see how the entire gauze is going in. Um, this whole thing, you can uh, push it. Yeah, and you can see. These are massive resections that you may have to do sometimes. So you can actually use the artery forceps to be in the midline and uh, so that it can guide your dissection. Using uh, the precise max wand, you can see how and you can see the muscle fibers. And, uh, and keep going in, going in, going in. You can either use a, your finger from the other end to see if you're palpating your wand and you should exit out. And you can see the muscle fibers here just playing out. That's... These are massive resections. TORS is another uh, sort of way. I mean, uh, I'm sure uh, most of you have uh, seen this videos. Um, this is a, a massive resection. The only difference between this and uh, um, the coblation is in TORS, you're using a monopolar I think this is the patient pain post surgery is just excruciating. So any day uh, uh, coblation as opposed to um, TORS. So not only uh, as a lot of people thought about it and say, okay, how does coblation tongue based resection compare to robotic? So to compare, uh, so this is a beautiful paper that compares efficacy and safety of transoral robotic surgery. It's a retrospective case control study. And basically they found out in comparison between TORS and coblation, for, in terms of TORS and coblation, one second. In terms of TORS and uh, coblation, a comparative rate of post-operative morbidity, including post-operative bleeding rates, taste dysfunction, foreign body sensation, um, and a non-inferior improvement rate was observed in the TORS group. But the use of monopolar Bowie robotic instrument may induce more post-operative pain than coplation, which could result in longer hospital stay. So those of us who have done it, we know that the pain with robotic is excruciating. So, to bring in the, uh, the sophistication of robotic and also the gentleness of, uh, um, of coblation, a newer technique called Robocop has come in, wherein uh, you can actually resect the tongue base exactly like how you can do it in robotic surgery. And then you can actually measure the, the, the specimen out and the results are fantastic. So with that, we will uh, come to uh, the skeletal procedures. Now, why is this important? This is also very important because you need to understand that skeletal procedures are also a way and are ways and means to treat um, uh, hypoglossal or I mean uh, hypopharyngeal kind of obstructions.
Now, when you talk about skeletal surgery for obstructive sleep apnea, it is very important that you understand the concept whether you are dealing with um, soft tissue or are you dealing with a situation where the uh, bony enclosure is the problem. So the emphasis has to be on why you are doing a particular procedure instead of how to do that particular procedure. And that is why, because earlier we used to think about as surgeons, we were only thinking about how to do this procedure, how to tackle the tongue base, how to do it. No. Think about why that particular uh, situation has come about in that particular patient. And, and we should be, that's why surgeons were called uh, uh, barber surgeons before, and whereas the physicians were the elite. So we, should, we have to also slowly shift our concept from not asking the right questions. The right question is, why you are doing that particular procedure instead of how to do that particular procedure. When you talk about skeletal procedures, the most important technique that is in, uh, uh, or the protocol that is used is the Stanford protocol. What is the Stanford protocol? The Stanford protocol is divided into two phases for any OSA surgery. And this has come back way back in the early 90s. And according to Stanford protocol, according to clinical exam, cephalometric exam, and fiber optic uh, pharyngoscopy, they decided that either you do a U triple P or a uh, or a, a genioglossus advancement and hired suspension, or just a geniohyoid advancement and hired suspension. This is just a very arbitrary, very crude way of deciding because they didn't have the dice then, and they did not understand the patterns of collapse, severity of collapse, and they did and they did these surgeries, and they did a post-op polysomnography after six months, and then they said, okay, it worked, we are very happy. If it didn't work, phase two, maxillomandibular advancement or MMA. And that was what is the, uh, the Stanford protocol. Now, there is a problem with that Stanford protocol. The problem with the Stanford protocol is it does not address the, uh, the issue of surgical relapse. A common concern among sleep medicine specialists, it does not address it. Second thing, there is no flexibility. Means you have to do the second stage, that is the skeletal surgery, only after you exhaust the first, which is soft tissue procedures and it does not incorporate the new procedures like upper airway stimulation, the endoscopic uh, uh, procedures, the tongue base that I showed, TORS and all these things, it doesn't. So what is the new uh, uh, Stanford protocol? The new Stanford protocol is based on dice and it's based on clinical exam. So you have to divide it into uh, the kind of, uh, so, uh, based on nasal obstruction or tongue base or palate. So if there is a significant nasal procedure, you need to incorporate a procedure called DOM, which I will talk to you about. If there is a tongue base obstruction, you can do a genioglossus advancement or an upper airway stimulation or a myofunctional therapy, or you can do any of the techniques that I spoke to you about. If there is a palatal obstruction based on the pattern of obstruction that I spoke to you about, you need to do a palatal procedure. Remember, I spoke to you about a type of uh, uh, obstruction called central uh, uh, circumferential, complete circumferential collapse, CCC, at the level of the velum. If there is that kind of an obstruction, you can either do any kind of a dental procedure or directly going for a mandibular advancement or an MMA. So how do you tackle relative macroglossia? Please remember in relative macroglossia, the soft tissue component is same as in a normal person, but the bone, the bony uh, component is less. So you have to fit in this into this. So the box has to be made bigger. So these procedures are called box procedures. 
So what are all the box procedures? Genioglossus advancement, hyoid suspension, and last but not the least, the heavyweight champion called the maxillary mandibular advancement. So let's first talk about genioglossus advancement. Genioglossus muscle is one of the major dilators of the upper airway. And it is the strongest and the biggest muscle that helps in upper airway dilation. In fact, it has been shown that its activity is greater in patients with obstructive sleep apnea than in patients who don't have obstructive sleep apnea. So these findings suggest that there is a rationale in doing this particular repositioning of the genioglossus muscle. But please remember that this is not done as a standalone procedure. So what are the investigations that you do for a genioglossus advancement? You have to get a cephalogram, either a CT cephalogram or a, just a lateral cephalogram. Two, you need to get a OPG. Once you get a lateral cephalogram and you do an OPG, you can actually understand if there is a very close approximation to the uh, of the genioid tubercle to the roots of the teeth. Why is that important? It is known that 30% of population there may be a contraindication to do this particular procedure because of the short distance between the dental root and the genial tubercle. And hence, when you do the osteotomies, you are going to hit the dental roots and hence you can't do it. And that is why you need to do these x-rays. So there is a variation to this called the slide genioplasty. Now, why is slide genioplasty better than advancement genioplasty? In advancement genioplasty, you are only bringing the uh, genioid tubercle forward, whereas in, in slide genioplasty, you are bringing not only the uh, genioglossus forward, you are also bringing the mylohyoid, the anterior digastric uh, forward. So why are all these muscles important? Because all of these are mild dilators of the upper airway. This is the Typical, this is the typical phenotype of this particular patient. You draw a line from the uh, nasion, if it goes down, this is the typical phenotype of our patients in whom you need to do a box surgery. See, this is the, uh, uh, this is the slide genioplasty. You can use any of your uh, 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 burrs. You can use a striker saw. You can use a fissure burr. And you can bring this forward to one cortical length. You can see that one cortical length, which increases the space. Now, the success rate is anywhere between 39 to 78%. Why is that? Because when you talk about the success rate of advancement genioplasty or uh, a slide genioplasty, because this is not done as an isolate procedure, you are, you are actually piggybacking the success rate of the palatal procedure as well. So even though you must have done an amazing advancement genioplasty, if the palatal procedure is not done that great, your success rate may not be that great. So that's why your success rate is being be anywhere between 40 to 80%. Now, how do you improve the nasal airway, especially the maxilla? I need to talk about this particular uh, uh, concept called lack of coupling. What is lack of coupling? For which you need to know what is coupling. Coupling is wherein when you sleep, your tongue, because of a negative pressure that is created between your tongue and the hard palate, it the tongue sits in your oral cavity and does not fall back. Now, that space should be enough. That means that, that, that kind of space should be created by the hard palate for there should be enough space for the tongue to sit in to create that coupling. So if you look at the hard palates, if the space in the hard palate is like this, 
very less. See this old, lad uh, old lady, if you, you see this gentleman, how will this tongue fit into that palate? It won't. So the cutoff, dear colleagues, is 30 millimeters. If there is less space here at the level of the premolar, there is no space for the tongue to sit in and you will have problems. So what you are supposed, what do you do? You, you do a procedure called distraction osteogenesis maxillary expansion. You put a mini screw device and you keep expanding it. So who are these candidates with loss of coupling? It, it is these candidates with loss of coupling wherein they are doing, uh, their mouth is opening and there is loss of coupling. So you can see in this patient, the tongue base is basically collapsing because of lack of coupling. And you've seen this, the tongue is finally basically just collapsing through the oral cavity. And this is a very important finding. You will only know when you do a transoral dice. So how do you go about doing this? You do a, you do a leaf foot one osteotomy. You do a leaf foot one osteotomy. And you go from the piriform aperture and up to the pterygoid, uh, uh, to the uh, pterygoid bone. And again, you do a midline osteotomy here. So once you do this, see, this is the Lefort one. And you're doing the midline split. And once you do that, this is how you get the end results. And this is how you, at the end of the expansion, you get a wide airway so that the tongue can fit in and you can get good uh, space. Once that is done, the, uh, the orthodontics is later done and the teeth are brought together. But the ultimate skeletal surgery is maxillomandibular advancement. And you want any kind of success rate. Look at this AHI from 100, it has come to 20. Apnea, obstructive apneas, 100 to 1. Absolutely thrilling procedures. And if you really look at long-term results of maxillomandibular advancement, very, very long-term, if you look at short-term, you are uh, looking at almost uh, four to eight years. They are talking about uh, long term, and very long term is eight years. You look at the AHI, eight and twenty-three, phenomenal success rates, and overall response rate of eighty-five percent and surgical cure rate. That means less than one for an adult. Pretty good success rates, and I'll just uh, uh, run this particular video for you. Uh, this is MMA for uh, uh, those of you who... So this is the first step of MMA, wherein you put the arch bars. And now we are uh, doing the in incision for the, um, for the mandible. And you're exposing the ramus. Um, and once you do that... You need to do a, I hope you can make out, this is the marking for the sagittal stit uh, osteotomy. Uh, we're using a fissure burr and a regular marathon drill. And we're using, uh, so inferior alveolar nerve is something that you need to be very careful with. Um, this is the lower jaw, dear colleagues. This is the sagittal split. This is the nose, this is the below uh, oral cavity, and uh, this is the upper jaw. Um, this is the junction uh, between the, uh, the gingiva and the mucosa there. Then you expose the periform aperture, and you take a periosteal elevator, 
elevate it. And then you can see that. You can also do any kind of a septal procedure or a septoplasty if you want to do in the same sitting. Now this is the marking. And again, using a Fisher burr, we're taking a leaf foot one osteotomy. So the first uh, on the left side, now we're doing the right side. So once that is done, these are all the different instruments that we do. And as we go hitting from the periform, you get a change in tone from like how you get it in the mastoid while you're doing the birth, you get a solid hit. And then you disengage the, the maxilla. So once you disengage the maxilla, <laughs> and then you have to make sure that it's only the muscles and the tendons that are attached. There is no bony involvement. So the maxilla should freely move in all directions. And once we do that, then we're looking at how much it has now. This is the final plates. And uh, I'm doing a, we're doing a advancement genioplasty in the same sitting. And we're putting the screws. So we've not only done a bimax mandibular advancement, we've done an advancement genioplasty as well. And this is post-op two weeks. There's a lot of edema, but very surprisingly, there is not too much of, of, uh, uh, of uh, airway edema. The whole airway just opens up. So these are our numbers. We have, uh, I think this is, uh, I can go online and say this is one of the highest in the country. Uh, we have almost crossed 70 cases, including distraction osteogenesis, uh, maxillary expansion. So MMA is one of the most efficacious procedures for the treatment of OSA. Uh, the success rate is about 80 to 100%. If there is any procedure in OSA that gives you this kind of number, it's MMA. It's a safe procedure. There are complications, but they are very relatively minor. Thank you very much. Boss. Excellent, excellent. Fantastic, sir. Um, I think you had uh, given me and given all of us a very, very, very detailed overview of uh, the surgical armamentarium, which is being used. And I really congratulate you for doing the highest number of MMAs. For me, MMA means middle mirror landrostomy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Okay. Now I have a few questions. Can we ask questions? or uh, Please. Yeah. Please. Yeah, the first thing I want to ask you is, uh, uh, what about the zeta plasty? You, uh, yeah. I mean, you said you're going to show yes. it so that. So uh, I can. Uh, I think. Uh, do you want me to just show it quickly? Yeah, better you show. Sure, because, sure, uh, sure. Vijay Kumar wanted to ask that question only. So many oh, people have asked. Oh, sure, me boss. That. Sure, yeah. sure, sure. See, that procedure is uh, is actually quite. Uh, let me just. Uh, Oh, Dr. Vijay Kumar wanted that, is it? It's in the desktop only. One second. Yes, got it. Mm. 
Yeah. Was I able to see the slight modified zeta? Yeah, boss. I can yeah. see. It. Perfect. So I'll start from here. So, oh shit! I think I have to unshare this, right? I have to stop sharing this. Can you see the modified zeta? Yeah, yeah, we can see it. We can see it. Okay. Ha. Huh. So modified zeta is a brainchild of uh, Michael Friedman. Um, this is a procedure that uh, has been modified and has been, uh, or um, well, it was a champion when it was done. Uh, very, very few indications nowadays. Very thick palette, you do uh, zeta, uh, uh, zeta plasty. Uh, so first I will run through the, uh, the pictorial things and then I will take you through the surgical steps. So one is after tonsillectomy, you create a butterfly. Now the median uh, in, uh, line should be the junction between the free margin of the, UV, of the soft palate and the junction between the hard and soft palate. And the lateral extent should be up to the pterygoid hamulus, right? Once you create that butterfly, you take any instrument and denude that entire mucosa and expose both the palatopharyngeus muscle and palatoglossus muscle. Once you do that, you cut the uvula and rotate it to the opposite raw areas that we have done. Now, the difference between classical zeta and the modified zeta is in modified zeta, you have to cut the medially arching fibers of the palatopharyngeus muscle as well, right? So, and then you, you suture the uh, respective cut parts of the uvula to the superior, uh, the, uh, the lateral most part of your uh, 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 denuded mucosa. The, the end, the, what, is the, what is the rationale behind it? The rationale is to create a scar vector, which is anterolateral or a centripetal scar vector. Now let's just go ahead with the video. So, but is it pixelating? No boss, no. Yeah, okay. So now I'm creating, this is the lateral part. We're using the, this is the median part. I'm using radio frequency and all my palatal uh, surgeries I infiltrate so that you don't get any oozing. This is now the midline. So it's one of the most painful procedures, but extremely gratifying. So you need to sort of clear off this whole thing. You need to expose the muscles. So this is the lateral part. This is the median part. This is the base of the uvula. So once you've created this whole area, raw area has been created. Uh, 
And the last part is the And now you can see the part that is completely excised. So this is the, again the base of the uvula. So I'm using a oblator to sort of clear this whole thing out. But please remember, so oblator doesn't mean OSA surgery. You can either do beautiful OSA surgery even without coblator using regular monopolar and bipolar. You don't need a coblator. A lot of people call and say, sir, I have coblator. How do I do sleep surgery? No, it's not that easy. Um, and um, there are lots of vessels that come there. So once you've created and released that whole area, this is the raw area that you can see now. Nicely tidy it up. And when you cut open the, the, the uvula, always, always start from above. So we, now if you're denuding the, um, the base, the mucosa from the uvula, because you want this raw area because it can be it has to be flipped and once that is done now the painful part of suturing starts see now you can see these two you have cut open the uh, uvula and then now we are the flap is going on either side. Please remember not to cut the uh, the, uh, the levator and the tensor. The levator comes like this and the tensor comes like this horizontally. And then again, like how I spoke, it's always in layers. And like this, layer by layer, and you can see how the whole thing now comes in. The muzzles are done, and this is the last part of the... Uh, and always remember not to tie the stitches tight. If there is anything that you would take home from today's lecture is whenever you do a um, palatal surgery, do not, do not tie the knots very tight. It will result in necrosis because the blood supply will be cut off. So this is how the whole thing is done by the end of the so. So the end result is a procedure like this. There is absolutely, but these are all gruesome uh, procedures. Slowly things have changed to barb because you'll get the same result when you do uh, barb. And this is a uh, uvula non-sparing procedure and extremely painful. So, Things have slightly, so this is how it looks at the end of the procedure. Very, very gratifying for that day and time. But nowadays, it's not one of the best things to do. Um, yeah. I hope it... Uh... Okay. Okay. Hello? Yes. I'm here. So, I'm here. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Now, uh, the second thing I wanted to ask is, I've seen some people doing the submental fat excision. Yeah. 
Uh, what's your take on that? So that used to be what is called as a Chabol procedure. It yeah. basically originated from France, uh, wherein uh, you will go about and take out that submental fat and you will go with a cublator from the neck. Yeah. Now, entirely very, very few procedures have been done and Frederick Chabol himself has basically abandoned that procedure because ultimately it didn't turn out to be having meaningful outcomes because if the uh, uh, one is you're having a cervical approach and if you do trans orally also, you will get the same kind of uh, result. So because it was a very sort of morbid procedure, uh, proce uh, the procedure has been sort of given up. Okay. Uh, the second question I want to ask is high heart suspension. So yes. you, you didn't uh, show yes, us the high yes, suspension. Yes. High heart suspension. I have the high heart suspension. Um, I have done a lot of high heart suspensions. It's an excellent procedure yeah. for, for lateral hypopharyngeal collapse. Yeah. A beautiful procedure. Um, can you show that? Yes, I can. Um, let me just... Uh, So you take a, a, a suture uh, uh, completely encircling the hyoid bone. Yes. Hyoid bone and uh, and suture it to the... So there are two variations. One is to the mandible. Mandible. And the other is to the uh, um, to the hyoid, uh, to this thyroid cartilage. I used to do it to the mandible and uh, the problem is the patient used to feel that, you know, the tightness. Yes. Whenever he extends, it's so difficult for him. Yes. One second. Are you seeing that? I had suspicion. Yes. yes, yes. Carry on. Yeah. Oh, shit. What did I do? Um, one second, boss. Oh, I think I put too many. I'll just stop sharing. If you don't have it, we can begin also. Uh, uh, anyway, you have no, one no, more. No, 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 I have tomorrow. it. Mm -hmm. I have it. I have it. Mm -hmm. It's... I think it's just that I was, uh, yeah, it's here. Let me just look for that, boss. It is definitely there. Uh, it is definitely there. Just give me one minute and... Can you see it? No. No, right? You have to share your screen. Uh, I will just... Now? Yeah, just... Uh, yeah, yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Yeah, so... Yeah, perfect. So now, you can see the dice wherein... I'm pulling the, uh, the hyoid and you can see that the lateral hypopharyngeal wall is basically expanding, right? Do you see that? As yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah. It's coming, uh, it's going away and I yeah, yeah. it's coming. So that is where, that is exactly where uh, hyoid suspension works. So this is the procedure. So this is the thyroid cartilage, as you can see. And uh, with caucus, we are holding the uh, the hyoid bone. What suture material? I use one zero proline. What about you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Was one o proline. So you come out, and then uh, I think I put the uh, edited video. Yeah, alternatives results. Oh no. 
Yeah, I think I have this as an edited video, boss. I'll show you tomorrow. No problem, no problem. This is, uh, yeah, so, but the idea is that, that uh, yeah, yeah. you do a thyroid, just like how the phonosurgeons do it. Yeah, yeah. We do it to sort of create space in the hypopharynx. Yeah. So, tomorrow, actually... And I want one more, one more question. Yeah. See, uh, I used to do one procedure. I mean, all these I used to do. <laughs> I am a funny guy doing a sort of, you know. Uh, I used to sling the digastric around the superior constrictor. Uh, yeah. Calling the uh, digastric uh, sling. So what is, I mean, have you uh, done yeah. that? And yeah, yeah. So, so basically, um, we need to understand that all these muscles we're swinging, right? They are... Once we swing them, they are not active anymore, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. they, so uh, you need to understand that airway muscles have two kinds of uh, uh, muscle action. Mm -hmm. So these phasic muscles and tonic muscles, all right? Mm -hmm. Now, these are not tonic muscles. They get fatigued very easily, the ones we are rotating. So... Mm -hmm. Unlike the genioglossus, mm. which is a tonic muscle, which is always tight. And mm. that is why hypoglossal implant works. Mm -hmm. Whereas the rest of the muscles we rotate, they mm -hmm. are not, they're phasic muscles. So at, in, in sleep, right, they also sleep. <laughs> so that is why those procedures don't work. Okay, uh, the uh, you're going to show about hypoglossal implant tomorrow, is it? Boss, I know because it's not. It, I can. I I have all the theory about it, but unfortunately, we are not allowed to do it or show it in India. So no, we no, just I, have. I mean, the, we can we can see the theory, right? We can yeah, see theory, the theory. All theory, I'll I will show you. Mm. Full theory, how it's done, and what are the different uh, implants: the Nixova, the Intera. Uh, mm. Inspire all those I will show. I have seen it being done in Germany. I went and I saw it also. Yeah, yeah. I came, but but I would like you to show that. What is wrong in showing? Boss? What is, I don't understand why. I mean, the, the company. The, the company. Uh, I mean, we spoke multiple times. I mean, Clemens, uh, who I'm sure you also know, Clemens. Yeah, yeah. Uh, who who actually had? So we are planning to go through the the uh, the European company Nixwa to get ah. it to India because they are not too rigid about, oh, the Inspire guys are just uh, too high-headed. Uh, How much is it? 12 lakhs, huh? How much is it? 20. Uh, 20 lakhs. 20 lakhs. Oh, okay. 21,000 US dollars. Ah, okay. Um, okay. So, yeah, 16, but, uh, so 16 lakhs. 16 mm -hmm. lakhs then to do the whole procedure. And, yeah, yeah. To, to the titration and all those things. But that's the future, boss. I mean, yeah, yeah. that's the future. Affordability and, will be the problem. No. We will, the, yeah. will become the problem, but lots of our people, they are now going to Singapore and getting it done. We should talk with the CM, boss. We'll, we'll go and talk to the CM of uh, Telangana. Telangana, we'll yeah. Convince him. In fact... It's yeah. not very different from a cardiac pacemaker. Do you know that? Yeah, it's just yeah, yeah. a pacemaker. We just have to put our heads together uh, to sort of, it's not like a cochlear implant. It's not that difficult. Very easy, boss. It's, yeah, a, it's just a simple pacemaker. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, if we, if your power is there, we can actually do it. No, we'll do it. We'll do it. Uh, so, uh, I just want to inform a few things. Can I, uh, with your permission, make some please, announcements? Please, please. So, uh, anyway, I'm sure that nowadays uh, we're getting lesser audience. The reason is because it's already on YouTube. And so they are uh, very crazy and they watch it on the YouTube uh, at leisure. So sure. uh, that is one reason why uh, the Zoom as such, they don't come, number one. Number two, uh, we have arranged for three different meetings uh, next week. Uh, so one will be on um, uh, fees, uh, oh, function fantastic. and evaluation of swallowing, and also um, uh, swallowing, um, all about swallowing. 
like for example, the fluoroscopic examination and all that. So mm. that will be dealt with by a professor from NIMAMS uh, mm. who is specialized in uh, deglutition. And then uh, we are having one on pediatric airway and it's a six hour talk to uh, divide into three. And third will be on uh, Dr. Vidya Sagar. Uh, uh, I think he'll be talking about uh, phonosurgery uh, uh, for, uh, 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 I think, I'm not sure. But anyway, so three talks you're going to have. Uh, I'm just announcing it. Sure, uh, sure. Dr. Satya will be arranging that. And uh, we are going to have one more talk by Dr. Srinivas Kishore, sir, tomorrow, uh, same time, 9 to 11, on um, pediatric, pediatric. Uh, OSA. Uh, Shilpi, uh, you, can, you can talk now. Shilpi, uh, you can ask your question. Unmute yourself. Shilpi? Shilpi is in Hyderabad. Hello, Shilpi? Uh, Shiva, unmute Shilpi, man. We have a resident uh, from Italy uh, oh. called uh, Dr. Francisco, and uh, she is one of the uh, bright students of Pro Professor Alberto Sch uh, Schneiber. Uh, uh -huh. He is a very close friend of mine and uh, a student of uh, Peri Nicolai, who is uh -huh. a very big name in the field of uh, rhino surgery and uh, skull base. Hey, Shilpi, can you unmute and talk? Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm unmute now. Sir, yeah. I had just one question. Is anybody doing fluoroscopic studies in Hyderabad? Uh, no. Okay, sir, who is anybody doing swallowing as such? Uh, um, in Hyderabad, like swallowing and swallowing therapy, like Jay Kumar Menon sir is... No, not to that level, yeah. There are okay. somebody, there are some guys, part of gastro they are doing in our hospital, in AIG. Hmm. As a part of gastro, they do manometry and all those things, but not from an ENT perspective. Nobody addressing phase two and phase one. Okay. Okay, okay sir. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sir. Yeah, Dr. Francisca. Would you like to uh, unmute yourself and uh, talk regarding your first day in Royal Pearl? Dr. <laughs> Francisca Ginarini. Hello. Hi. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Today was my first day. It was, was very nice. Can I'm you, can you uh, show, show your face, please? Show my face? Wait. Yeah. <laughs> it must be. <laughs> She's a uh, very, very enthusiastic uh, Hello. fellow. Hello, everyone. Hello. And uh, I'm very excited for this month. Mm -hmm. I'm just waiting for what hi, will happen. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> so tomorrow you're going to see some very interesting cases. Exactly. Acoustics to acoustics and, uh, you know, uh, pituitary surgery with some uh, tumor going intracranial fibrosis lesion. So very nice. Very nice that you came. And I, uh, you are seeing one of the best surgeons in India, the subcontinent doing sleep apnea. That's why we invited you. Pleasure to have you here. Hi, it was a pleasure also for me. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Srinivas Kishore is one of the pioneers in this uh, field. Oh, no, and he's doing a lot of work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So tomorrow we'll do everything pediatric. Yeah. And we will have a little bit talk about hypoglossal nerve implant. And yeah. a little bit of what is called as myofunctional therapy, which is very, very, very important post uh, uh, sleep surgery. So we'll talk about okay. that. I think Shilpi has okay. raised her hand again. Shilpi, you can you can talk. Uh, sir, can you uh, have a few slides on revision surgeries? Yes. Complications I have. My own uh, nasopharyngeal stenosis, oropharyngeal stenosis. I have... Tomorrow we you can, can do have that. one more one more class, boss. That is, yeah. uh, we can have it on Wednesday also. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to. I won't, don't want to bombard you guys. Um, we can. Uh, I can do a separate. Baby. I can do a separate session for you guys. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Right. So thank you very much. It's already yes, late. Sir. Thank you so much, thank you. Dr. Srinivas. Thank you. Really, really, uh, you know, seeing you. I'm so, so happy that you're uh, just so enthusiastic and want to teach across the globe. So, so sweet of you. Thank I'm you. I'm sure that, uh, you know, last time we had a lot of participants from Peru. Yes. Carlos was there. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, your friends are all there. They were appreciating your talk so much. 
And I'm yeah. sure they'll be seeing it. And uh, because the Peru is the other side of the globe, so it's a different Correct. time. So Correct. tomorrow Correct. morning, uh, they will give me the feedback. Sure, sure, sure. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Good, Good night. night. Good night. Good night, Chilpi. Good night. Good night. Good night.